One day we may retire our rockets and instead reach the heavens by ascending towers so tall they dwarf mountains and rise above the sky itself. The tallest structure in the world, at over half a mile or 828 meters tall, is the Burj Khalifa in Dubai. It's not very far from the land of Shinar, the region of ancient Mesopotamia where it is said the Tower of Babel was built, seeking to stretch the heavens themselves. That story is typically associated with pride and hubris, and that's often been true of many projects for constructing the tallest buildings or largest palaces or temples. Even in modern times these gems have often been financially absurd and indeed the reason the Burj Khalifa is the tallest building isn't because we can't build taller, it's because there's no compelling reason to build so high. It is easy to forget that even the biggest and grandest of cities like New York or Tokyo only have a few hundred skyscrapers, while each place boasts over a million buildings, and often even those values come only from using the most generous lowest mark for a skyscraper, which is unofficially viewed as being at least somewhere between 100 to 150 meters tall, or 40 to 50 stories or more. The reasons to build that high is partially for maximizing super valuable real estate in packed downtown regions where your cost per acre might run a few million dollars, compared to a few thousand in my own neck of the woods, and that alters the equation for usage, where the cost of an individual floor or level is actually less than the land in a city on, unlike virtually everywhere else. They are one reason to build tall and even then, less for economy than for premium space and prestige, to have an office or apartment that grandly looks out upon the vast city and coast below. Rents for these higher floors are higher, which is the only option that makes it profitable for buildings so tall even in our densest cities. After all, with the US average of around 1,000 square feet, or 100 square meters of house per person, the entire world population could be housed in a square 40 miles or 60 kilometers aside if you had the 160 stories of the Burj Khalifa. That is not even a percent of a percent of Earth's land area, so you really need a lot of people to build that high out of an actual economic necessity for living space. We've discussed structures like that where your building isn't just apartments and offices, but parks, factories, and farms, immense mega-buildings called arcologies. But even these are rarely contemplated as being kilometers tall, you just start getting heat issues with individual floors at that point. We can already build that tall if we want, it's quite an engineering hassle, all the more so if you haven't got effectively infinite budgets, but the science there is fine. Alright, we can build tall, but can we build all the way to space? A space elevator is a structure most folks are familiar with these days and ironically it is a revision of the basic concept. Most buildings rely on compressive strength to hold their weight up, how much you pile on something before crushing it. Tensile strength is its twin, how much weight some rope might hang before it snapped under the weight. Around 30 years ago we discovered ultra-strong tensile materials, various carbon allotropes like carbon nanotubes and graphene, so we envisioned hanging a vast tether down from geosynchronous orbit to run an elevator car up from below, but before that we contemplated a different option just building a tower so tall you could launch from it, and we'll be re-examining that option today. Now a space elevator actually goes beyond geosynchronous height, 22,000 miles or 36,000 kilometers, but the principle is that at that height, the speed an object orbits at is the same as the planet's spin rate. The further you get from Earth, the slower you need to move to remain in orbit, while the larger the circle you actually need to orbit around to complete one orbit, so the longer your orbital period. It's around 8 kilometers or 5 miles a second just above Earth's atmosphere, and gets you around Earth every 90 minutes or so, but at 22,000 miles you only need to orbit about 2 miles or 3 kilometers per second. And that orbital path is a lot wider than Earth, so it takes a whole day to cover it, and the Earth is spinning at the same rate below you, hence geosynchronous, or geostationary when right over the equator. Tower or tether, there's still a decent amount of gravity there, so you should be falling downward, but the building itself is moving at orbital velocity sideways as the planet spins. So on that floor, if you jumped out, you would just hang in space, and indeed you'd have no net gravity on that floor. One above it, and you would be swung to the ceiling, albeit under microgravity. One below, a very tiny amount of gravity would pull you down, and you could apply a little thrust, even a sneeze, to enter a stable orbit. 
Again, tower or tether, this makes a great launch mechanism since you can use the heights above this to slingshot off into space, as above this height everything is swinging around the planet faster than orbital speed. And even just part way up the tower, you can jump out and spread some wings and basically land anywhere on the planet. Now building a tower 22,000 miles high is ambitious, but even one just 100 miles up gives us some options, especially if we do multiple towers. At that height, you're above the vast majority of the atmosphere, so you could build a runway that didn't have to mess with air drag and also circumvented the rocket equation. You would need no propellant since the runway is below you to push off of, and propel you down it. This makes space launch very cheap, albeit still more expensive than the full-blown geosynchronous tower taller than the planet is wide. This is awesome as an airport and spaceport then, the more so since it avoids loud rockets that make leaving directly from a city bad. So we have an obvious motivation to build that high, it makes for ultra-cheap travel around the Earth and to space, and down from space too. There are materials and methods that can allow us to seriously contemplate building such high buildings too, channel regulars would know of active support for instance, but for the moment, let's ignore the materials and ask about what the rest of that tower does. For those wanting more details like how active support works and how you can build things like this off the equator without them tipping over, see our Upward Bound series episodes, particularly Lofstrom Loop, our original Space Tower video focusing on space fountain launch mechanisms, and orbital rings. Now you might build a tower that just juts out wider at certain key altitudes and was otherwise super skinny, but let's contemplate one for the moment that was not pencil thin. Although a tower even just 100 miles tall that was as wide as the widest skyscraper around would still make a pencil look thick. At that thing's peak you would be able to see over 700 miles in each direction, and have something like 50,000 stories to it, and maybe 4,000 square meters or 40,000 square feet per floor, a 200 by 200 foot square in which you might easily have 40 modest apartments on each of the 50,000 floors, 2 million dwellings, probably housing around 5 million people. This raises the elevator conundrum tall buildings have, see our college episode for details, but we'll skip that for today. We tend to assume these things will be wider since they are so tall but there's no special necessity for that, beyond it being easier to taper as you rise. Since the value is in the height, there is no reason to build wider when you go taller, or not to just build another one nearby or elsewhere once you're at the minimum useful or economic width. We can seriously contemplate some structural 40,000 miles tall and 10 miles wide, with 20 million floors, each 100 square miles, which is itself a space 10 times larger than all of Earth, land, and sea, and home to 56 trillion people. There are hypothetical technological pathways that might even see something like that be viable and practical. But the difficulties are more than one might first think. For one thing, buildings like this are better thought of as something like a sprawling river civilization or one built up along a highway, all long and stretched out with problems running material from one side to another, the vertical equivalent being that elevator conundrum I mentioned a moment ago. As an example, in that first more modest scenario we mentioned of a 100 mile tall tower, imagine a single, wide road with apartment buildings on it, a few stories high, that was 100 miles long and every person or parcel entered on just one side. That's 5 million people on one long road or river. This is potentially viable, especially if it's a decently wide road and we can get away with having crosswalks over and under it, but some very extreme measures have to be taken to ensure you don't get log jammed, and it really helps if most of the traffic is only moving a little bit locally, not all the way to the end on most trips. This elevator conundrum, which again we discuss more in our ecology videos, is a major limit on building tall, as it's hard to add extra access high up in the air, the way you might bisect a river civilization with some perpendicular roads. We usually get around the problem mostly by trying to minimize how far traffic and cargo have to go, so you don't need to ship in all that food because it's mostly grown a few levels up or down from your apartment. On space towers, your neighborhoods are by height, not area, and your zip code presumably is altitude related, mile 12,345 or so on. This is one of the ways we get around heat radiation on an urbanized planet too, you do big towers into space and pump heat up them from below into great big radiating fins. A given space tower might have thousands of tiny branches going off it covering its vicinity in big leaf-like affairs that pumped heat out to radiate into space 
and possibly also absorb sunlight for extra power. These might be scaled up to be individual leaves many feet wide or even football field wide, and they might always be thin and flat, you might have protrusions that were someone's apartment or space dock or village. Once you're above the atmosphere a lot of the engineering headaches go away, albeit a lot of new ones pop up too. As an example, while you're still in the atmosphere, every window above a kilometer or two high needs to be robust, airtight, and have blast shuttles and airlock designs in mind. This need not necessarily be a big thick steel curtain that slams shut where the window is, it might be the door into a given room was built to airlock standards and the walls similarly so that only that room is vented into space from a puncture. A lighter and easier option than a blast shuttle would be a strong thin net that could catch most items while the pressure dropped, and then a robot drone in the wall could pop out with the equivalent of a sturdy garbage bag and an oxygen mask to cocoon someone while rescue forces spun up. Or maybe even some robots and sensors at external positions had that same setup but were complete with a parachute, so if you or your dog went flying out the window or off the balcony, it can intercept you and attach the necessary safety gear. I would not be surprised if this was technology we saw in the next generation or two for handling jumpers of tall buildings or bridges, or for rapid building evacuation for infernos, possibly in tandem with drones bringing in heat shielding garments or latching onto people's face to provide oxygen. As an amusing side note, given how dubiously biologically plausible the alien xenomorphs from the Aliens franchise are, I wonder if a team of scientists first encountering a facehugger would initially conclude it was an alien biomechanical automated breathing mask for emergencies that grabbed the first humanoid target in the event of an atmospheric pressure or composition change. The ways you handle damage, be they accidents or intentional acts of war or terrorism, controls how plausible structures like this are able to be built, and it attracts a lot of wild and inaccurate speculation. For a space elevator for instance, If you sever that cable, that part above the cut is going to snap up like a rubber band and begin drifting into space, not fall down wrecking all its path as it wraps around the planet. Even the part below the cut which falls is not some kind of doomsday scenario, it's going to flop down at more normal air speeds, not orbital speeds. A cable designed for a transport car maybe a foot thick is definitely damaging any buildings or trees it flops onto and leaving a small crater like a shallow roadside ditch in its wake. Thinner ones might do some roof damage and for thicker ones you have the option of including separation charges along the tether and parachutes, after all the same hyper-strong tensile material that makes for a good tether makes for an awesome ultralight parachute. For an actual tower built on compressive strength, it should be able to crumble straight down, and that would be locally devastating. In practice it helps to build sturdy and to use both compressive and tensile strength if you're building ultra tall. Safety is harder here than some thin tether, as our 200 foot by 200 foot wide, 100 mile tall tower with a cubic volume of 21 billion cubic feet might easily mass 100 million tons. It would not be falling at the speed an asteroid does, as it probably has a fairly low terminal velocity for individual fragments, somewhere in the 50 to 100 meters per second range so the net impact might be on an order of hundreds of trillions of joules. That's nothing to sneeze at, but it converts to around tens of kilotons TNT equivalent, the smaller end of atomic bombs. So it is definitely in the evacuate the city around it, many folks will die, property damage is huge category of catastrophe, but not in the civilization will come to an end sort of way. Bigger towers are going to be way worse, of course, but you're essentially dropping a mountain on a planet at that point and it is going to be like an asteroid impact. There are things you can do to prevent and mitigate that though, we also need to keep in mind that nukes aren't magic hand waves that ignore materials, and if you have ultra strong building materials, they might be able to handle being hit by jets or spacecraft, or even a modest nuke, without being any more damaged than a skyscraper that a car or truck plowed into, or a single engine private plane. Though how a nuke might function inside such a building if detonated might get rather counterintuitive depending on how it was built to handle pressure and atmosphere loss, radiation inside such a tower would also be quite hard to remove. Going up higher than the atmosphere, into the actual void of space, we also have to throw radiation into the mix, as you have only your glass window or whatever material protecting you from lethal ultraviolet and cosmic rays, and at higher levels even the Van Allen radiation belt. 
A material needs to be especially robust to survive that sort of environment, constantly peppered with space debris and micrometeors while space dust and radiation just erode everything. It makes windows at those altitudes seem more likely to be steel shuttered options that rise only when in use. Of course we can't remove the option that the towers might be self-healing or growing either. We obviously aren't building these things unless we get some better technology for a tower like this, either ultra strong materials or energy abundance or warm temperature superconductors or vastly superior automation for construction. Active support provides potentially infinite compressive strength but only as long as the power is on, which runs up quite the power bill unless you've got cheap energy or great superconductors and magnetic shielding. Any of those technologies opens the door, some better than others, and it would be best to have all of the above. Fortunately I'm of the opinion we will by the century's end. Let's consider three specific cases to close our discussion out. Our first will be a space tower on Titan, the largest moon of Saturn. The second one will be the 100 mile tall tower we discussed earlier, which we will call the Houston Tower. The other will be our true geosynchronous space tower case, which we will call the Sundial. Titan Tower represents an interesting case as Titan has no real living area down on the surface. It is 60% the surface area of Earth, but it's not a great place to live, essentially tundra but with ice that you wouldn't want to melt and drink. You can do domes, so long as you make sure they're well insulated, to avoid freezing you or melting the ground under you, or causing a spark near an oxygen leak to set off a fire, since Titan has seas of hydrocarbons. The domes also need to be built sturdy against the slightly higher surface pressure. Titan has a far thicker atmosphere than Earth, but far lower gravity, so air pressure is about 60% higher than on Earth, comparable to what a diver would experience just 20 feet underneath the sea here on Earth. Leaks to the domes will be fairly low threat, as most of the air coming in is nitrogen with a bit of methane. Titan's atmosphere is thicker than Earth's and high in nitrogen, something the industries of the inner system need to fuel their habitat expansion in the asteroid belts and the megadomes of Mars. So Titan Tower looks a bit like a tree, thicker on the bottom with big roots and with several skinnier branches curving off over the atmosphere. It is built to suck minerals, sea, and air in at lower levels and process them on the way up into immense metal nitrogen tanks which are accelerated by magnets on the voyage up and then shot out of one of those branches at high speed. Those branches are themselves space docks for more conventional spacecraft but the pods come out as they are shot by a cannon and fall faster. The pods contain a beacon, some sensors and transmitter and receivers, and a tiny computer can carefully ignite a bit of the hydrocarbons also contained in the pod for some guidance and course correction and power, otherwise those tanks are giant pods of liquid nitrogen heading to Mars or a space habitat needing more air. Titan Tower is fairly empty, having only a small portion of its space given over to habitation, but it is still home to over a million people working in the various support wars for the tower's operations and general improvements to Titan, like ocean floating dome habitats. This being the late 23rd century, they obviously use robots for nearly everything work-wise, and Titan Tower ships out over 100 million tons of nitrogen every day. Unlike Venus, which also has a thick atmosphere, Titan isn't a good spot to be trying for large towers with buoyant sections that can just float. There will be places out in the galaxy where this might be true, super Earths or Hycean planets might be an option. However, the low gravity on Titan largely eliminates the need, though you might use a buoyant section to float on oceans, placing the tower on a wide raft rather than ground. Houston Tower, an example of a large tower 100 miles high and 200 by 200 feet square, is part of a sequence of towers running across the southwestern US, and its penultimate stop. Each tower has a runway built from it to its neighbors a couple hundred miles away. A very great deal of the interior space are vacuum train paths allowing material to ship up and down faster and easier than through air itself, and more people pass through the tower every day than live in it roughly 10 million people, and a megaton of cargo take Houston Tower up to its runways, many smaller, which are essentially long cannons for electromagnetically slinging G-resistant cargoes into space, and just as many folks take the trains hanging under the runway as the ships launching above as it makes for fast access to earlier destinations along the runway and a higher final speed for any ship running the whole length. Some trains on it are basically open pads on which many personal spacecraft can be carried on each car 
and released at full speed at the end, flying into orbit with the empty train retrieved afterward. Houston Tower's eastern twin, the last on the line, floats in the Gulf of Mexico on an enormous raft city several miles wide that includes many homes and lawns and ship docks. Both towers and their siblings have many observational balconies, some requiring airlocks and pressurized suits to go out to, from which tourists will jump with the intent of parachuting, hang gliding, or diving down. Each tower costs over a trillion dollars to build, though in the year 2323 that represents only a couple hours worth of national production. We'll talk more about life in the year 2323 AD, two weeks from now, in our 400th episode. The Sundial and its cousins, built in the 23rd millennia, represented a far larger investment, only possible on a planet that's the crown jewel of humanity's sprawling mega-civilization of Quintillions. The Sundial is fully 10 kilometers wide at its base, and tapers as it rises, but never narrows to less than a kilometer in radius, widening again as you approach Geostationary, where are thousands of ships that would dwarf a modern oil tanker dock at it during any given moment. It has 4 million levels, at an average of 10 square kilometers a level, and at its highest are many long tethers hanging out and up behind it that ships can run out on for even higher launch speeds. Entire O'Neill cylinders cluster around its higher levels, tethered together to share and cancel the minor perturbation tugs from not being exactly at geostationary orbit. The sundial gets its name from the immense shadow it casts that moves over the day, and it is so wide that at many places it eclipses the sun for several minutes a day. Each of its four million levels is essentially a city in and of itself, though in practice it has overlapping levels and other places where the roof or level might be a hundred meters high, not three or four. The sundial is so immense, it can be seen anywhere in the hemisphere on a clear day, appearing to be a thin, barely visible wire rising into the sky. Seven Mile City, population 100 million, is a region incorporating fully 30 entire floors and large chunks of several adjoining ones above and below, and 1,500 square kilometers of city area, including vast sky docks where airships and other low-velocity airborne vehicles and yachts often dock and are manufactured. Large buoyant structures ripple out from these levels, enormous but dwarfed by the Leviathan that is the sundial, population 8 billion, not including tourists and travelers. Most of its space is given over to hollow vacuum transport tubes followed by large hydroponic facilities, water and air recyclers, and only roughly 1% to actual living quarters. A billion travelers pass through it from Earth to space, or vice versa, every single day. The Sundial is the most popular destination for wealthy interstellar travelers hoping to walk on the surface of humanity's cradle world. 100 billion visas are applied for through the tower every year. In its 200 years of construction and 20 centuries of operation, the Sundial has survived multiple attacks and rammings from spaceships and dozens of internal conflicts between sections three of which involved the employment of nuclear devices inside the Mega Tower. While originally being a relatively homogenous culture when first being built, over the centuries and conflicts it has diverged into many different peoples with many different languages. Could we go beyond even this, make things bigger? Yes. In theory you can build even taller. Indeed you could make such towers like the spokes of a wheel and with a vast orbital ring between them that could meet with an even taller tower out from the Moon, which always shows the same face to Earth, and directly connect the two. That would work particularly well on Pluto and its moon, as we discussed in Colonizing Pluto where we contemplated an actual rigid tower connecting the surface of both places that we dubbed the Acheron River. Nothing stops you from doing that at the interplanetary scale, and such a tower might begin having rotating ring segments as it rises to add spin gravity to replace or combine with the lowering surface gravity as you gain altitude. Indeed you might do vast hollow vacuum launch tubes down the center and use a thin pressurized ring around for people to live on. And these could potentially end up as tubes something like a Topopolis mass driver entire astronomical units long, designed for launching ships, or a tower light days tall running between the millions of world shell levels of a birch planet, 
where time would run slower at the bottom and the top would open up only to the eternal darkness of the galaxy you disassembled to build the billion billion worlds of that titanic mega planet. It is hard to say when and if such super tall structures would ever be practical, even the more modest ones, or if superior options might prevent them being built even if we could, but when it comes to envisioning them for the future, there is no real maximum height placed on space towers by physics, and they can rise into the clouds and beyond. As we like to say on the show, dream big because the sky is not the limit. As I said a moment ago, one of the show's mottos is to dream big because the sky is not the limit, and yet it can be hard sometimes trying to figure out where to get started on turning your dream into reality. For a lot of people, summer is a time of change, or a great time to begin a new project and learn some new skills. And if you're looking for a great community to develop those new skills, I'd recommend Skillshare. Whether you're looking to relax and work on your garden, do some sightseeing and snap some breathtaking photos, or sit down to write that novel you've been working on, Skillshare has the courses to help you on your learning journey, and you can try them all out for one month free by joining up with Skillshare, giving you access to top-notch content like Lincoln Michael's course on science fiction and fantasy creating unique and powerful worlds that can help you take some of the concepts we discussed on this show or you've brainstormed up and turn them into compelling world building for a realistic and entrancing tale set in a distant future or a fantastic and strange new world. Take control of your future and make it a reality, and let Skillshare help you. Try them out today by using the link in this episode's description. The first 1,000 people to use the link will get a one month free trial of Skillshare. So, we wrapped up this year's International Space Development Conference in Texas, and I hope you had a chance to attend. But if not, there are many other online and in person events for the National Space Society, and the National Space Society of Australia is hosting the New Horizons Summit Friday, June 9th, in Sydney, Australia with a theme this year of creating a thriving cis little ecosystem of companies. I'll link the details in the episode description. Well, we reached up into the heavens in today's episode, and we'll continue that a bit more metaphorically this weekend, as we look at higher dimensional aliens and 4D realities, then next week we'll discuss the possibility of using science and technology to create artificial afterlives, and two weeks from now, we will have our 400th regular episode of SFIA as we contemplate what life might be like in the year 2323 AD. Then we'll wrap up June with our monthly livestream Q&A on Sunday, June 25th, and then on Thursday, June 29th, we will ask what Earth might be like if humanity disappeared. If you'd like to get alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to hit the like, subscribe, and notification buttons. You can also help support the show on Patreon, and if you want to donate and help in other ways, you can see those options by visiting our website, IsaacArthur.net. You can also catch all of SFIA's episodes early and ad-free on our streaming service Nebula, along with hours of bonus content at go.nebula.tv slash As always, thanks for watching, and have a great week. <laughs>